There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. today. So we started this brand new series uh, last week, uh, The Surprising Gift of Christmas. What if it's better than you could ever imagine? And uh, Pastor Brian got us started looking at the topic of wonder uh, in the Christmas story, uh, specifically out of Luke chapter 2. And next week, uh, we're going to be looking at the surprising joy, a uh, surprising gift of Christmas and the Christmas story. Today, we're going to focus on we're going to focus in on one person, sort of looking at some scenes from the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus, some, some scenes that revolve around her and some biographical details in Mary, the mother of Jesus, that I think could serve as a way to bless and inspire us all as a model of living a responsive Christian life. So if you're with me, let's go ahead and turn to the scripture. We're going to go back just a little bit from where we were last week. We're going to turn back to Luke chapter 1, and we're going to look at a scene that happens when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary in the middle of the night and startles her and speaks some incredible things to her. We're going to pick up that story in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. I think we're going to put the words up on the screen, but I'll read it to you out of the NIV. So Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, the next verse says Mary was greatly troubled, and that's because it wasn't a common occurrence for an angel just to appear and begin speaking, no matter what the angel was saying, even though it sounded like really good news. If an angel appeared to you or I in the middle of the night, I I think we would be startled. So verse 29 says Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now that's referring to generations before King David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And verse 34, Mary says, how will this be? since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. Do you know who her child was? John the Baptist, right? And she who was said to be unable to conceive is already in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. Love that. And in verse 38, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. In another translation, it says, Mary Mary responded to the angel, let it be with me according to your word. I love that. Let me pray and we'll jump into this. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you this morning for the opportunity to come into this place, to worship, to sing songs of praise to you. And we pray that you would inspire us, Lord, this 
this Christmas season. Speak to our hearts now and show us a glimpse of how we can live a, a life that responds to your word, how we can bear your word within our lives, and how we can bless others, how the joy that you bring into our lives at Christmas can be a blessed joy that flows through us into the lives of others, blessing them, encouraging them, lifting them up, and giving them joy too. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, I love this scene. I love how Mary is first troubled, but then the Lord, through this angel, calms her heart. And then Mary ends up saying, let it be with me according to your word. Let it be. Let it be with me according to your word. It's almost an echo. It's almost an echo all the way back to the creation story in Genesis 1. How things came into being. How God said, let there be light, land, animals, human beings. And now Mary echoes back to God, let it be with me. And new creation comes into being. God establishes creation by saying, let it be. And then his own creation speaks back to him and says, let it be. And something brand new begins. What does it look like to say, let it be to the happening of God in your life? What does it look like to say yes to God? What does it look like to say yes to what God wants to do in your life? To say yes, I will let the word happen in me. To say back to the creator who said of you, let it be, to be able to say back to the creator, let it be in me. To be a person, don't miss this, who agrees to be the kind of place where God can act, where God can do his purposes and his will. Mary gives us a beautiful example of how we can say yes to being a person who receives and bears the word of God for the world. Ah, the joy of saying yes to God. Can I get a witness? Those opening words in the Gospel of John also come to mind here, where he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And in verse 4, where in John chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, in him was life, and that light was the light of all mankind, the light shined in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's not my word that bears life. It's not your word. It's his word happening in me that bears life. Mary says yes to God. And I would like to ask, what would it look like for you right now on December 9th, 2018, for you to say yes to God. And what does it look like to be a people who receive the word and who bear the word to the world, the word of God for the world around us? I love what Pastor Brian wrote in his blog back on November 27th. If you follow the blog, there's a, there's a lot of wonderful things to reflect on in that blog, and on November 27th, he wrote that life is constant adjustment, constant change. He wrote, life is swirling, changing, dancing, flowing, and that's the life that you and I are invited to when we receive the word and bear the word to the world. So Mary says yes to God. But here's the thing, and I'm sure I'll get no disagreement, pregnancy, is a burden. So Mary says yes, but wow, what is she saying yes to here? And gosh, I'm glad guys don't get pregnant. <laughs> because speaking on behalf of all men, um, not just in the room, but on the planet, uh, we simply couldn't handle it. Am I right? Yes. Pregnancy, now, so Mary, I want you to see, there's a, there's a little bit of a metaphor I'm playing with here. In James, there's this... This, this line where James, the brother of Jesus in the New Testament, he says 
that we should meekly and humbly receive the word that is planted within us because it is able to save us. I want you to think about this metaphorically, but also literally. Mary is, is saying yes to God and bearing the word for the world. But there's a lot we can learn from this. Think about her pregnancy for a moment. Pregnancy is a burden. Saying yes to God can invite us to actually step into something that's going to change us and can feel very burdensome. It's fascinating what happens when someone's pregnant. It changes a woman's body. It changes her diet. It changes her tastes. It changes her sleep pattern. It expands her. It stretches her. And bottom line, saying yes to God is saying yes to change. But the point of this message series is that it also begins to open you up to a life of flourishing and a life of possibility that is better than you've ever imagined. The story goes on. Mary has this divine encounter through this angel Gabriel, and then the story continues. Let me read verse 39 through 45. And so Mary goes to Elizabeth. At this time, verse 39, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, Mary, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, Elizabeth said, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Mary goes to Elizabeth for confirmation. And probably Mary goes to Elizabeth for consolation too. Mary is recognizing that she's been asked to do something she can't get her head around. She's been asked to do something she can't do. And friends, this is the way of our God. He is only interested in, in doing with you what you cannot do without him. God is only interested in doing with you and I what you and I cannot do without him. And Mary knew that she couldn't bring to bear what God was doing in her life without the presence of others. And ah, the joy of Christian community. Church, you and I need Elizabeths in our life, in our lives. We need to lean into community and to say to the older women, teach us. Give me confirmation. Give me consolation and teach me. We need to say to the older men among us, show me the way. And when Mary runs to Elizabeth, the child inside Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. Imagine that. When we say yes to God, we can unintentionally bring joy in other people's lives. You don't even have to try to bring life in everybody around you. If God is at work in you, your very presence can help bring somebody to life. Your very presence can bring people awake to God and to the joy that is in their lives. I actually thought it was very appropriate for a baby to be crying a couple seconds ago. <laughs> And listen, Mary may have gone to Elizabeth just out of sheer excitement. But just being a human being, I recognize Mary went to Elizabeth because she was probably feeling like she, she needed some help. She was probably feeling weak. She was probably feeling like she needed some encouragement. And you know what? Weakness is okay. Christians don't have to be strong all the time. Christians don't have to be certain and confident all the time and strong all the time. So Elizabeth blesses Mary. She says, blessed are you among women. She says, blessed are you. And then out of Mary comes this song, this beautiful song of praise. And friends, I want you to look just below the surface here at what's happening. Because that, my friends, 
is what Christian community looks like when it's working well. God is at work in me. I realize that I need help, and I come to you. I come to you for help, and out of you comes affirmation. Out of you comes wisdom. Out of you comes confirmation and assurance and blessing and care and love. And then out of me comes praise to God. Praise and worship and joy and a deep confidence then comes to, out to God. I love what Mary says in her song. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Let me read you a little of what Mary sings. So Mary says, let it be to God. She leans into community. She's blessed by Elizabeth and then she sings, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. I love how she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Isn't that what we all want? Regardless of what we're going through, regardless of the circumstances that you're living through right now, to be able to say, my soul magnifies the Lord. To have a joy so pervasive that you're able to just sing to the Lord, my soul magnifies the Lord. Mary could have been terrified, paralyzed, unreceptive to the work of God in her life, and then stayed stuck. But instead, she says, let it be, leans into community, is blessed, and then out of her comes joy, and it's better than she's ever imagined. Jesus is the surprising gift of Christmas and the life that he brings. And some of what we're celebrating when we come into this place is we're celebrating that Christmas is the fact that God is always better than what we expected, always other than what we anticipated, always better than what we have imagined. Amen? Amen. Do you ever feel lowly or weak or insignificant? Jesus comes to the lowly and to the weak, like Mary. But being lowly and weak makes your life a perfect site for the action of God. Precisely because we are weak and lowly, his strength can do great things in and through us as we make room for the surprising gifts of Christmas in our life. And this is what we are called to do. So God is at work in our weakness and in our loneliness to work in us his strength for his glory. So what comes next in this story is Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story that we looked at last week. And this is part of the story that we're, the, the, this is the part of the story we're the most familiar with, where Joseph and Mary, they go to Bethlehem. And Jesus is born in this little feeding trough of an animal. And the angels announce good tidings of great joy that will be for all people and to the shepherds in nearby fields. And then when Jesus was just eight days old, so eight days old after, his, after he is born, his parents, Mary and Joseph, bring him to Jerusalem to present the baby Jesus to the Lord. And so that takes us to the next scene I want to look at. So Mary and Joseph show up with the little infant Jesus, and there's this old man that they come in contact with named Simeon. Boy, I love Simeon in Scripture, and I love, I love what he has to say. He has some very uh, beautiful words of blessing, but he's got some sobering words too. He's been promised through a prophecy that he would be able to see the Lord, the promised Messiah, before he died. And so he says in chapter 2, verse 29 through 33, Simeon took the child in his, in his arms and praising God said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. I can imagine Simeon leaning in close and saying this to Mary, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And he says to Mary, 
And a sword will pierce your own soul too. So he starts off with these incredible words of blessing and Mary and Joseph are amazed. But then he says specifically to Mary these very sobering words. One of the reasons why you and I need to to show up at church is because it's amazing what other people can tell us about what God is doing in our lives. Old Simeon knew more about what God had done and what God was doing in Mary's life and through Mary's life than Mary knew. And that's the way community is supposed to function. One of the reasons why we show up at church on a Sunday morning, one of the reasons why teenagers, we show up, why students show up at Fusion on a Sunday evening, one of the reasons why men's, uh, men's groups happen on Wednesday and Thursday and women's groups on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and more is because there's somebody here who can tell you what God is doing in your life and you'll never really know it any other way. Christian brothers and sisters saying to one another, this is what I see God doing in you. And it's better than you've ever imagined. This is the gift of God that I recognize in you. Giving each other insight, giving each other perspective, giving each other encouragement. And many times we see and we recognize what is going on in somebody's life before they do simply because they're living so close to it that it's hard for them to have perspective. And that's one of the surprising gifts of being within good Christian community with one another. So Simeon blesses them. They are amazed. And then he says, this, he says to Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many. And that's what it looks like when Jesus is born in you, not just for Mary, but for all of us. When Jesus is born in you, when we become Jesus followers, we also receive Christ's wounds. You cannot be the mother of Jesus and not suffer the wounds that Jesus suffers. And likewise, you cannot be a Christian who bears the word in your life and not suffer what the word suffers. And so we are often grieving and wounded. Well, you become a Christian. Does everything become perfect in your life? Of course not. But it's not always because something has happened to us, but because the, there's the life of God, the flourishing life of God that we want so desperately to see happen in somebody else's life is not happening. They're not saying, let it be. Friends, your lack, your lack should grieve me more than my, my own lack ever should grieve me and vice versa. Jesus wants us to forget ourselves, to die to ourselves, and to care for somebody else. And as a church, Jesus wants us to show up ready to give. Every time we show up, ready to give. Not worried about what we receive because we are here to give. We know how to do this with our children. When we see our children happy, it makes us happy. When we see them experiencing joy, it it gives us joy. We're not jealous of our children's happiness, right? You don't see your children having fun and say, hey, that's not fair. I'm not having fun. If you do, well, we might, we might need to talk about that. But what would happen in our, in our church if we felt that way about each other? Maybe you don't feel the work of God happening in your life right now in this moment, but you can look around and you can see it in somebody else's face. You can hear it in their praise. You can hear it, you can see it in their life and just rejoice in that. Take joy in what God is doing in other people's lives just as much as you take joy in what God is doing in your life. I just wanna fast forward to one more scene, one final scene before we're done. It's much later, it's decades later, after Jesus has grown up. Now, he hasn't started his ministry yet. He hasn't, he hasn't performed his first miracle yet. But Jesus and his mother are invited to a wedding. And they're there at this wedding in Cana. And it's in John chapter 2. And I'm not going to put it on the screen, but I'll paraphrase it for you. So Mary and Jesus, they're at this wedding. And there's a party happening. It's the reception. And Mary is very perceptive. She notices something. She notices that the wine is running out. And so she says, Jesus, 
can you help? They're running out of wine. And Jesus says, I'm paraphrasing, mom, look, my hour has not yet come. But I want you to see something here just below the surface. Mary knew what Jesus was going to do, even though he responded to her rather sharply in the moment. My hour has not yet come. Mary is so acquainted with the character of Jesus. And to be a Christ follower is to get so acquainted with the character of God that you know what he is going to do. You just know he's going to rescue. He's going to redeem. You just know that he's going to restore. He's going to renew. You know he's going to have mercy. You know he's going to show grace. You know he's going to show loving kindness. Boy, we can invite people to church. We can share our faith, invite them to know Jesus. And we just know that God is going to do what only he can do, that he's going to bring life out of death. He's going to bring goodness out of evil. And so Mary says to the servants, knowing the heart of Jesus, she says, do what he tells you to do. And sure enough, Jesus says, fill these barrels with water and take them to the master of the feast. Will they do it? And it has changed into the finest, the finest Cabernet Sauvignon. It's changed into the finest Pinot Noir. It's changed, if you will, into the finest grape juice. And I want you to see something here, because it's a model of a a responsive Christian life. See something in Mary. She notices the needs of others before they did. To be a Christ follower is to notice not only the activity of God in somebody's life, but the needs of others before they do. Just like we notice the blessing of God and the activity of God in others before they do, we can notice in others' lives their needs before we do. And Mary is the first to notice the wine is running out and the party is not over. And she wants the celebration to continue and the joy to continue. And and so she has this awareness that leads her effectively into prayer. She goes to Jesus. And this is how our lives should be marked by the surprising gift of joy that we have in Jesus. That we see because we are so in tune to others. We see the activity of God in people. But we also see their needs before they do, and then we take that need to Jesus. Not to be the kind of person who sees the wine is running out in somebody's lives, in somebody's life, and then we criticize them. Mary could have done that. She could have said, who planned this wedding party? Who's the master of this ceremony that they didn't know they were going to need more wine? How many times in my life have I seen somebody else's need I've seen that maybe the wine is running out of their life. And I thought to myself, what's wrong with them? All the ways that we experience wine running out of our lives, financial problems, loneliness, addictions, pain, suffering, financial problems, unfortunate behaviors and choices. But Mary, the one who said yes to God and the one who leaned into community, didn't say, what's wrong with them? Their wine is running out. How foolish. They didn't prepare better. No, she just runs to Jesus and she says, they're running out of wine. She runs to God for what only he can do. Who cares if they plan well or not? They're running out of wine. And she knows that Jesus can do something about it. And he does. What will it look like this Christmas? What will it look like in your life to say like Mary did, let it be in my life to say yes to God and then to follow Jesus, to bear the word, to lean into the joys and the blessings of community and to discover in your own life the surprising gift of Christmas, the joy of Jesus and his hope his mercy and his love. Last week, we looked at wonder. This week at Mary as a model of the Christian faith, someone who received joy and gave it. And may you find that joy is better than you've ever imagined. May God so bless you that you can sing, my soul magnifies the Lord. Let it be in me, Lord, according to your word. Let it be in me.